Good evening, everyone. My name is Fleur Watson, and I'm the senior curator for Unlimited. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here to moderate this evening's discussion, Real Impact, with Bunker Roy. Now, speaking a little bit earlier with, with Bunker today, he asked me to keep this introduction very short. One sentence only was his request. Um, it's a bit of a challenge. I'm not quite sure exactly how I can put the life and work of this extraordinary man into one sentence. But su suffice to say that he embodies the spirit of design thinking throughout his work over 40 years at the Barefoot College and its program training women throughout India, Asia and Africa as solar engineers. Without further delay, I'd like to invite Bunker to the stage. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Permit me in the next hour to turn your world upside down <laughs> and take you with a journey with me. I went to a very, very expensive elitist school and college in India. And uh, it was not, I was not supposed to go back to a village at all. My life was laid out. And um, it just so happened by sheer curiosity, I went to a famine in Bihar in 1965, and it changed my life. And then I uh, came back home and told my family that I'd like to live and work in a village. Didn't go down well at all. <laughs> My mother went into a coma. <laughs> and she said, uh, what do you want to do in a village? And I said, I want to dig. I want to be an unskilled laborer digging wells. That didn't go down well at all either. Because <laughs> all my, because my jobs and everything were laid out for me. In my previous life, before I went to a village, I'd actually played squash for my country. I was the Indian national squash champion, three years. <laughs> played all the Australian greats, Jeff Hunt, Camden, Cairo, Ken. And um, then going back to a village where everything is zero miles per hour. You're, you're used to a hundred miles per hour lifestyle and all of a sudden you go back to a village digging wells. And that was when I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge and skills that very poor people have in the villages of India. I had no idea that this knowledge existed or the skill existed or the wisdom existed. They don't, you don't hear about it in your college. You don't read about it in your university. You have to feel it. And I felt that this knowledge and skill which I was slowly being exposed to had to be brought into mainstream thinking. Why is it that in India or abroad, we look for knowledge and skills outside in a university. When it's right there in the village itself and the solutions are all there, the simplicity of it all, everything is right there and we're looking abroad for solutions. So I thought I'd start a college only for the poor, built by the poor, managed by the poor. And it would contain something which would only reflect what the poor thought was important. By the end of five years, I knew how I would define a professional. A professional is someone who has a combination of competence, confidence, and belief. So what a diviner for me would be a professional. 
A traditional midwife would be a professional. A traditional bone setter, you'll find in the bush somewhere, even in, I believe, in Australia too, would be a professional. I used to laugh at this priest, Belgian priest, who walked around with a stick. And he said, come here, boy. And he helped me, made me help, hold the stick in front of my And he said, walk. And I walked, and I felt very stupid. And he said, stop. I stop. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and the stick went up. And he said, now bring it down. I couldn't bring it down. And that was the first lesson I learned from this 70-year-old Benjamin priest. Never laugh at things you don't know. Nowadays, whenever I have to dig a well or locate a well, I would get a water diviner to look for my well. And after he leaves, I would get my geophysicist. And 90% of the time, it's true. There is traditional knowledge and skill out there which you just don't know and you're not exposed. So the barefoot professionals of Thelonia are people who are from the village, who have this tremendous knowledge and skill, which we reflected in the college. The other thing when we started the college, when I went to the village for the first time, the elders came to me and said, are you running from the police? I said, no. You didn't get a government job? I said, no. Failed in your exam? I said, no. Why are you here? Why are you in this village? I said, I actually want to live and work here. He said, not possible. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> You're not telling us the truth. Be honest. This is what the formal educational system in India does to you. Makes you think that just because you had what is called a good education, you should be going, looking north, Zurich, Delhi, New York. If you come back to a village, it's a punishment. Something wrong with you. So we wanted to change all these attitudes which were coming in the way. And the other thing they said was, Please don't bring any paper-qualified people into your college. So it's the only college in India where if you happen to have a master's or a PhD, you're disqualified. <laughs> Can't come. You have to come as a human being. You have to come with some qualities which you may have picked up from your family. You know, Mark Twain said, never let school interfere with your education. School is what you learn to read and write. Education is what you get from your family, your environment, and your community. In a formal educational system, you don't learn about compassion. You don't learn about generosity. You don't learn about tolerance. These are things that you pick up from your family and your environment. And I thought that was a very important lesson we learned. So then I went to Thelonia, which is about 500 miles southwest of Delhi. It's a small village, very, very small by Indian standards, 2,000 people. And we started the Barefoot Professionals. And we, at that time, I was asking myself, as well as others, where is it written? that just because you can't read and write, you cannot become a doctor, you cannot become an architect, you cannot become a dentist, you can't become an engineer. Where is it written? It's all in our minds that you just have to learn how to read and write to become this, to provide this skill, to provide this service, to acquire this knowledge. So we wanted to disprove everybody and come up with a college which had people who were from the village Dropouts, copouts, washouts, who had never ever been through a formal education to provide a service to their own community. Why barefoot? Because it is symbolic of millions of people who walk barefoot. Because it is reflecting the tr traditional knowledge and skills and wisdom that already have exist in the village. 
College, because it's a place for learning and unlearning. It's a place where you make mistakes. It's a place where you try crazy ideas. It's a place where you fail and you, you're battered and bruised and you try again. And it's the only place where we don't give a certificate. Because we don't think certification should be given by the college, it should be given by the community. If you have provided a service to your community and they endorse it, they respect it, apply it, then that is certification enough. So when I said this to my colleagues, they said, prove it. Who are you to say all this and not show it on the ground? So that's when we started building our college, built by the barefoot architects of Thelonia. Built at $1.50 a square foot by 12 barefoot architects in three years. 2002, show miracle, we got the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. But they said there must have been an architect involved. We said there was a youngster involved who made the blueprints, but everything in the blueprints is reflected. All the knowledge and all the wisdom of the college is reflected, is what the people in the community said. And this put into a very boring blueprint, yes. So I must be the only person who's actually returned the Aga Khan Award and the $50,000 because they suspected that the barefoot architects of Thelonia didn't make it without the architect. When he came up to the roof, I went to a forester and I said, would you like to uh, tell us what to plant here? Of course, the forester had a PhD. He came up and said, not possible. Nothing will work here. You've got rock under the ground. No way. There's no water there. Then, of course, I did the wisest thing. I went to an old man and I said, what do you think I should plant here? Ah, he said, do this, 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 this. That's what it looks like. Came to the roof. Then the women said, clear out. All the men clear out of the campus. Because the women had a technology they didn't want to share with the men. And it is very old technology. And this is to waterproof the roof. It's a mixture of jaggery, urine, God knows what else, I didn't ask. <laughs> but it was built in 1986 hasn't leaked, hasn't collapsed, and they still keep that technology, they won't share it with the men. <laughs> Rajasthan, I've been there for 45 years now, and there's been sometimes it hasn't rained for five years at a time. So when someone told me that Brisbane is going through a drought, I was just wondering what they call a drought here. Is it one month of no rain or what? So then we went back to the elders and said, what should we do? They said, what our grandfathers and great-grandfathers were doing, collect rainwater. Why aren't you collecting rainwater? Don't listen to the architect. Don't listen to anybody else, collect rainwater. So all the roofs of the college are connected underground into a 400,000 liter tank, which is under the stage. And we use the stage for performances whenever we have um, traditional media, dancers, singers. For four days, they all come and they all watch. It's the only college which has also gone into the 21st century. You've got optical fiber cable, video conferencing, broadband. It's the only college which has a speed post service. So if you happen to buy any Thelonia handicrafts, barefoot college handicrafts, you just look at www.thelonia.com and you can buy all the handicrafts and it'll reach you in seven days from this little, little itsy bitsy post office. <laughs> and that's the college where 150 people stay, live, work, very Gandhian. 
Very simple. Very down to earth. Everyone sits on the floor, eats on the floor, works on the floor. No one can get more than $100 a month ever. Because you come for the challenge, you don't come for the money. So, and it's the only college which don't sign contracts because we trust and believe in faith. And we believe that you should have an equation which is personal. A piece of paper shouldn't come in between. So you can stay for as long as you like and you can leave tomorrow. And it is the only college which gives a very, very poor salary. And people wonder how people stay for 20 years. No problem. Because we treat them like human beings. And we don't have a hierarchy. It's a non-structured organization. It's the only college which is fully solar energized. All the power from the college comes from the sun. But the person who did it for me is a Hindu priest who has only done eight years of schooling. He knows more about solar energy than anyone I know in any college or university anywhere in the world. He still looks after the temple, and we have about 60 kilowatts of panels on the roof, 700 lights, 700 fans, my electronic mail, my telephone exchange, photocopying machine, everything works off the sun. It's the only college in India where we give you solar cooked food. Beauty of that solar cook, solar cooker you see is a parabolic solar cooker. That's the dining hall. Is that it was fabricated by four illiterate women who have never been to school or college. That is a very sophisticated parabolic solar cooker that you have in a very simple workshop. Regrettably, these Indian women are almost half German. <laughs> because they are so precise. <laughs> if it goes a bit here and a bit there, you can miss out. And these women have terrified all the other rural women in Thelonia because they're so good. We also were the finalists of the Buckminster Fuller Award. And uh, we talked about a geodesic dome which everyone told us was so sophisticated, so complicated, that you really need to go through years of schooling to make it. When someone tells me that, I go to my local village blacksmith and say, can you copy it? And he said, of course, no problem. <laughs> no problem at all. So the whole campus is full of geodesic domes made by a village blacksmith who can barely learn how to read and write. We have uh, a milk booth. We have an internet cafe. So if you should ever happen to come, it's broadband. It's faster than Delhi sometimes. <laughs> and a milk booth. And we made it into a pathology laboratory. And in the pathology laboratory, we got two physically challenged people we picked up from the village and said, now in six months you have to be a pathologist. And they said, what the hell is that? <laughs> we said, well, you have to learn how to test sputum and urine and blood and now we have two physically challenged pathologists, barefoot pathologists, they love being called doctors, they all wear white coats and they test for the rural poor in 10 rupees what would otherwise if they were doing it in Jaipur cost them 500 rupees so we're bringing down the cost. We also make toys out of waste all the waste we recycle into toys for 150 schools. These are toys that we make at the village level in the campus, generate employment so that people can actually stay in the village and not leave. We also have the only community radio station in India. 
It's located in a village, and we reach about 50,000 people through the community radio station, fully solar energized. So we have no problems. We think that the women are the backbone of development in India, indeed the world. In India, you'll have them doing handicraft work. That's handicraft work that we're doing. And we are saying that you must change with the times. No longer can you do handicraft work and stay in the kitchen. You have to do something else. You have to actually do someone a work that a man does. So instead of making handicrafts only, now they're, making, now they're repairing hand pumps. First thing, very sophisticated stuff. They actually lift the hand pump from the ground 150 feet below and repair it. They're masons. They actually make water tanks. All illiterate. Please, never have any of these women been through a formal education. And they are my solar engineers, the first barefoot solar engineers of India. They actually look after the repair and maintenance of the campus. We have a dentist, a grandmother who's illiterate, who's been trained to be a dentist. In six months, they're going to know, they're going to be able to perform a root canal for you. We make our own films. Twenty women are actually feeding my information into the computer. This woman is a street fighter. She got exhausted and said, look, I am fed up of speaking to 5,000 people. Can you give me something else to do? I said, well, why don't you sit on a computer? They said, didn't you hear that I don't know how to read and write? I said, sit on a computer, take your time, don't be in a hurry. Six months later, they came to me. She came to me and said, I can make you a water map on a computer. I said, are you, are you willing to talk about it? He said, yeah, because she talks to 5,000 people dropping her hat. So she went to Bangalore, chief minister of Bangalore, and she was facing 500 with kids who had just come back from Silicon Valley. And she started talking about her experience with computers. She got a standing ovation because they couldn't understand how this woman, illiterate woman, could run a computer and show how she could train other women. She's training other women. Wherever there's a high percentage of illiteracy, the traditional media is very strong. Where you have no radio, where you have no television, where you have no newspapers, we reach the message through puppetry. Usually in Rajasthan, the puppetry is in five-star hotels, if you've been to some of these hotels in India, and they all talk about kings and queens. This puppet is my psychoanalyst, he's my doctor, he's my donor, he's my problem solver, he's my lawyer, Anytime I have problems in a village, I call, this man's name is Joachim Chacha, and he solves all my problems. All my puppets are made out of recycled World Bank reports. <laughs> the vice president of the World Bank actually asked me for a puppet. I said, yeah, sure. Keep it with you because that's the only way you can really get to the rural poor, through my puppet. Rainwater harvesting, very, very important 300, 400 year old technology. See how beautiful it is. No architect, no engineer actually made it. It's made by the people themselves. Butte still working today in Rajasthan. Beautiful, designed perfect. These are, used to be rainwater harvesting and they used to be right on top, but because of engineers who started pumping water from the other sides of the, all over the place, you find all these are dry, unfortunately. They should actually be revived. 
So this technology we actually transferred into the schools. Look how badly designed the schools are. You saw those, see those red dots? They're all letting water go out of, the out of the roof. So what we did was to take the technology which we've learned from the people and put it back and we collect rainwater in schools. Very easy, get the community to make a pit, line it, waterproof it, $15,000, 100,000 liters you can collect. Doesn't matter if it doesn't rain. If it rains, should it rain, when it rains, wait. And when it rains, it rains like a flood, and then it goes off for the next two or three months. But when it does, we train and we collect over 100,000, over 100 million liters in 300 schools when it rains. Show you a very short film. It has been estimated that nearly 2 billion people have no access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Most of them earn less than $1 per day and live in remote villages across the world, concentrated in Asian, African and Latin American countries. Most vulnerable to preventable waterborne diseases are the women and children. They are the hardest hit because they have to walk for miles to fetch 20 litres of water for drinking that has to last a family of four the whole day. When children should be in school learning how to read and write, they are spending hours fetching water from open wells and hand pumps. One reason why rural girls do not go to school is because there are no toilets. It is a sad commentary today that after spending billions of dollars to provide drinking water to villages, 90% of the rural schools around the world have no access to safe drinking water and toilets. Expensive, unsustainable solutions have not worked. Drilling and installation of hand pumps, exploiting the groundwater, is only affordable in schools close to cities. Piped water supply schemes, where the centralized water source is hundreds of miles away, is too expensive to replicate on a large scale in remote, inaccessible villages. There is an inexpensive solution available to traditional communities all over the world. The practice of collecting rainwater from roofs of buildings. Where there is a great urgency and desperation, communities have applied traditional knowledge in schools and community centers by collecting rainwater in underground waterproof tanks using low-cost materials and local skills. All over the world, from Fiji to Colombia, India to Senegal, we can learn from the wisdom of indigenous communities how to collect rainwater to ease the pressure on drinking water and drastically reduce the drudgery of women and children. The experience of rooftop rainwater harvesting in India is worth mentioning here. More than 500 schools today in eight Indian states of India have started collecting rainwater from rooftops in schools. Over 50 million litres is collected in schools, providing drinking water through the crucial dry months for over 20,000 children. The total cost of the entire project is $5 million. Today, governments and communities are working for low-cost solutions where the impact is felt immediately. The dependence on professional water engineers to provide drinking water has failed. Now the time has come to depend on the rural communities offering their own solutions. Communities are no longer prepared to wait for years for centralized water schemes to be implemented, when even after the project is implemented, drinking water is not available. The long-term solution is to allow the communities to collect, manage, administer, control and own the water source. It is possible to collect 100,000 litres of rainwater in a school and complete the project in six months, costing just 10 cents per litre. This covers the digging of the tank, waterproofing, 
labor costs, connecting the roofs with pipes, simple water filtration devices, covering the tank, installing a low cost hand pump, supervision, documentation and administrative costs. In an effort to make this a global movement, the Global Rainwater Harvesting Collective has been registered in Amsterdam in the year of fresh water in 2003. In 2004, community-based organizations in Senegal, Ethiopia, Nepal and India have been contacted. They have sent their community leaders to the Barefoot College in India for training. Work has started in schools using locally available materials and the response has been phenomenal. The question always being asked and for which there is no answer is why did we not think of the solution before? What was the reason we did not apply this practical solution based on common sense for all these years? More community-based organizations in Sierra Leone, Kenya and Uganda are approaching the collective and will be covered in 2004-2005. As a movement, this idea is catching on and there is great enthusiasm that finally a low-cost solution has been found where the community has control and ownership over their own water source, harvesting 50 million litres of rainwater in the mountainous, desert, forest and coastal villages where it is prohibitively expensive to provide drinking water in any other way. Thank you.